Welcome to Live at Say from Brussels. Today's guest is Daniel Baer, Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. My name is Nia Gomez, and I'll be asking him your questions today. Our topic is on the human rights of LGBT issues. Dr. Baer, welcome to Live at Stay from Brussels. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Let's start off with some of your thoughts on LGBT issues as a, hum as a fundamental human rights issue, and then we'll turn to questions. Sure, well, I think, um, you know, over the last few years, the United States has um, stepped up in a way that has been uh, visible in many places around the world uh, in defending the human rights of LGBT people. And, you know, the way we see this is actually as a uh, logical continuation of the role that the United States has played for many decades in supporting the human rights of all people around the world. And um, whether you're working within a country or within a town or uh, within the world, there are often people who get left out once you establish standards or recognize standards of human rights. Um, there are often people who get left out and left behind. And part of the work that's important for, for those of us who are working to support human rights protections is to make sure that people aren't left behind. And one of um, the most likely um, determinants, there are many determinants that make somebody more likely to be left behind. The women are more likely to be left behind and let out of, left out of human rights protections. Members of minority groups like religious minorities or ethnic minorities are often more likely to be left behind. And LGBT people in many places around the world uh, are more likely to be left behind. And so this seems a a logical area of work for um, a country whose foreign policy is premised on a commitment to human rights for everyone. Thank you. Um, Secretary Kerry gave his first policy address yesterday on LGBT issues. What are the main messages the Secretary made that you would like to share with the journalists? Well, I would first of all urge uh, the journalists to, who, are, who are watching to take a look at Secretary Kerry's remarks from yesterday because I I think um, one of the things about them is that they were deeply personal, and so um, my ability to replicate them uh, in his voice and, and with his stories is, is, uh, is uh, it makes it difficult. Um, and his remarks are available on the State Department uh, website at state.gov. Uh, but I think, you know, part of what he did is to put this in uh, a broader frame. Uh, Secretary Kerry has been fortunate to have a long career in public service, and one of the things that I appreciated about his remarks was the way that he talked about how he, uh, as a public servant, has seen um, this issue uh, evolve over time in our domestic context and indeed internationally, and the way that uh, personal experiences for him have made uh, clear the importance of engaging on human rights for LGBT people as part of our larger project of engaging on human rights for everyone. Thank you. So, Dr. Baer, you've played a significant role in Obama's administrations on LGBT policy abroad. What do you think have been the biggest accomplishments so far? Well, I think, um, strangely, I think the biggest accomplishment is probably the, the, the least flashy accomplishment, which is that uh, as you start to to integrate a new policy, uh, a new strand of policy of foreign policy, or a new policy in any government agency, you know, at the beginning there's you know big events, speeches, etc. But in order to really make it happen and make it happen day to day, you really need to institutionalize it. And one of the things that we've succeeded in doing is really um, uh, supporting and working with the great ideas that we have uh, in our colleagues around the world at 250 posts around the world to make sure that um, this is not just something that happens at w in one speech from the secretary, but something that becomes part of the day-to-day -day work of our foreign policy, of implementing our foreign policy. And I think one of the greatest successes is that um, there are hundreds of people around the world who work for uh, the State Department and USAID, who are um, diplomacy and de uh, development assistance professionals, for whom this is some part of their daily work. It's just part of what we do. And so, strangely or paradoxically, by becoming routine, uh, we have succeeded. Thank you. And what are um, some key remaining challenges that you see? Well, I think um, there are a number of remaining challenges. I, I, a lot of the challenges are, are practical or Im implementation challenges. Um, the president obviously issued a memorandum um, to, uh, to the, the agencies of the federal government that are engaged abroad uh, on December 6, 2011, the same day that Secretary Clinton gave her speech, former Secretary Clinton gave her speech in Geneva, um, articulating our policy. But it takes time um, to implement it. Um, there's there's uh, 
you know, work left to be done in making sure that we're doing everything we can, for example, in protecting LGBT refugees. There's a system set up to protect refugees, to help uh, refugees uh, get to safety, and we have to make sure that um, in its practical implementation, we're doing everything we can to work with partners and work with UNHCR to make sure people are trained, to recognize unique needs, et cetera. And so there's always more work to be done in that respect. I think, you know, as we look around the world, the thing that stands out perhaps as the most urgent problem um, is uh, laws that criminalize consexual same-sex uh, conduct. Uh, laws that criminalize being gay, um, criminalize people for who they love, even where they're not often enforced. Obviously, where they are enforced, they result in people being thrown in jail for a terrible reason. Um, but even where they're not enforced, they send a signal to the rest of the population about who counts and who's worthy of protections. And that itself um, creates the kind of environment where discrimination and stigma occur and where people are more likely to get beaten up or suffer uh, abuses. And so I would say removing laws that criminalize um, being gay uh, is, is one of the urgent pieces of work that rem remains. Wonderful. So we'll turn to our journalists. We have questions from Robbie Corriboulet with the Associated Press in Dakar, Senegal. What would you say have been the most significant and or concrete achievements in the area of U.S. promotion of human rights of LGBT people overseas since the memorandum signed by President Obama in December 2011? Um, you know, I think, the, as I was saying uh, a couple of minutes ago, I think the most concrete uh, achievements are the way that it's become part of the daily work of the State Department um, and USAID. Um, I think there have, you know, it is not to be understated the significance of having a U.S. Secretary of State give the first major address by a foreign minister uh, around the world on these issues. You know, she, uh, former Secretary Clinton spoke for 45 minutes um, in Geneva. She spoke to a, um, a hall full of delegates from other countries and laid out the case for why this remains urgent, uh, an urgent human rights issue and part of American foreign policy. And having that articulation of policy is in a itself um, a significant achievement. Obviously, you can't just let that stand, and, and her, her speech wasn't actually a kickoff event. We were already doing a lot of things, but we have to keep doing them. Uh, I think one of the, um, the significant achievements that we've had so far is that in many places around the world, our embassies are now much uh, much in much better touch with local activists and advocates who are making the case for change from within. And, you know, if changes are going to come, if, if societies are going to become more fair, if bad laws are going to be thrown out, off the books and, and good laws are going to be put on the books, those changes are most likely to come not from the United States saying that those changes are needed, but from people within society saying these changes are needed. And so one of the achievements, I think, is actually that we are connecting in a, in a more consistent way with the internal change makers, the, the, the people who really will be the agents of change in many places around the world, and doing what we can to, um, to lend support to them um, at, at, as we see fit. Uh, and so that's been a real, um, it's a very fulfilling area of work uh, for us, and it's consistent with our broader support for civil society around the world. Great, thank you. Um, Robbie's second question is, what is your response to criticism that the State Department and the U.S. government generally have not been sufficiently vocal in the response to anti-gay legislation that, uh, like that introduced in Liberia in 2012? You know, I mean, I guess um, it, 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 it depends how you define vocal. I mean, there, are, there have been numerous instances in the last few years where we have spoken out in, in various uh, countries, in various contexts, uh, at the UN, other places, about our concerns about either legislation or abuses. Um, and so we do speak out publicly. But it's not, the, uh, our sense is that it's not the case that in every uh, instance, the most productive way for us to be engaged is to uh, issue public statements. There are many cases where we might um, urgently uh, reach out to the prime minister or the president or reach out to members of parliament and, and convey our concerns. Uh, and we think that, you know, in some cases that makes more sense. In all cases, one of the things that we try to do is to listen to civil society, to listen to the people on the ground, to take our cues from them uh, and, and understand what they think will be successful because it, it's, it's their efforts that we're trying to reinforce and certainly we want to make sure that our, 
our efforts are complementary to those, and the best way we can do that is to listen to them. So, you know, I think there's a mix of approaches, and we have to. One of the things that we're that we've done over the last few years is be able to kind of tailor our approach to the to the context. And so, and there's not one one rule for how you do this. Nice. You, you you try to make sense of what's going on in a particular place and how you can be most productive. Great, thank you. So we have a question coming from Jake Okunshuku Edufi from Nigeria. Um, it's a really long question. He's a freelance radio presenter with the BBC Media Action and an LGBT advocate. And so he's asking that um, Sir, Michael Posner made a statement that on the issue of LGBT rights and issues around the world, he quotes, rather than stand in the sidelines, America has decided to get in. You also said something in the lines of the struggle to end discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons is a global challenge and one that is central to the United States committing to promoting human rights in Nigeria. Both houses of the National Assembly have approved of the passage of a same-sex marriage prohibition law which seeks jail um, to LGBT persons for, for uh, 14 years if they get married. And I'm sorry, there's a continuation, including if there are witnesses to any union. Uh, I believe the, the question is, the bill is only awaiting uh, assent by the president. Is there any intervention from the U.S. to this. Has anything been done? What do you think is the best strategy to protect the millions of LGBTI, excuse me, Nigerians who are in fear? You know, we've uh, followed uh, the progress of that bill closely. I, I know that it uh, passed uh, the House uh, recently. We haven't seen the final version of the bill, and I know that it hasn't yet been signed. Um, you know, as we do everywhere, it's it's not uh, the the opposition to to legislation that would criminalize uh, either talking about or um, uh, making an NGO uh, coming together to form an NGO or things like this. It it's not a it's it's not an opposition for our sake. Um, it's an opposition because it's inconsistent with internationally recognized human rights principles. It's an opposition because it's counterproductive to many of the other objectives that countries have. You know, one of the parts of um, Secretary Clinton's Geneva speech uh, that I think is worth remembering is that she pointed out how societies that are more inclusive, that are able to embrace diversity, are more successful economically, are able to harness the talents of all of their members. They're more able to tackle uh, public health challenges because when you leave some people out of your public health interventions or when you stigmatize a population like the LGBT population, you drive, you drive the challenge uh, into, the, into the shadows and you're not able to protect your whole population. And so there are all kinds of reasons why it's not just that it doesn't make sense, f uh, that it's a threat to LGBT people when, when laws are, are, are passed and, and put into place. It's a threat to all members of a society. And so, you know, that's the kind of conversation um, that we have in many places around the world. Thank you. We have it. The next question comes from Marina Bikurvovic from Key Connection Media in Serbia. From whom does the LGBT suffer discrimination the most? Wow, I mean, I think that's a, qu uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I think that probably you'd find a different answer to that, uh, both in different places and from different people in different places. I think, you know, many LGBT people probably feel like um, their families are a place where they are discriminated against. Um, I, Obviously, you know, that's part of the reason why um, they seek, um, as we all do, an environment in which we can feel like we can bring our best self to the table and, and harness our talents and, and create a fulfilling life. Um, you know, l legal protections can be very helpful to people when they feel um, that they're discriminated against at school or in the workplace, et cetera. Um, I don't know whether there's a single answer to that, but I think um, one of the things that's clear is that people in government, um, people who are in public leadership positions, whether that's in government or they're, they're public figures because of their professional achievements, they could be artists, et cetera, they can really make a positive contribution. People in government can make a positive contrib contribution by creating the legal protections that people need 
in order to, um, to combat discrimination. And people in the public sphere, more generally, have a contribution to make because they can contribute to the kind of environment in which societal discrimination is less likely. They can speak out and talk about, even where it's unpopular, and talk about the importance of building the kind of society that embraces everyone and that recognizes that all people are born free and equal in dignity and rights, as the Universal Declaration says. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question coming from Mathieu um, Tachero from Europolitics. If possible, could you compare LGBT policies between the U.S. and the European Union? And what lessons could the U.S. or the EU take from each other? Um, you know, I mean, I think in general, uh, the U.S. and the EU, this is an area uh, of uh, where we, uh, like many others, uh, with respect to human rights, where we have uh, good dialogue and good cooperation. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we are, uh, I've, been, uh, I've been in Brussels the last couple of days, this is one of the topics that I've discussed mm -hmm. with my EU colleagues, and so we're eager to, to work not only with our U European colleagues, but with, our, uh, with partners in Latin America, uh, the South Africans have taken an enormously important leadership role in the UN context, uh, uh, partners in Nepal and elsewhere uh, in Asia. So, you know, I think uh, there's, a, there's a, a growing number of states that recognize that this is part of the human rights work of our time and that want to work together and partner mm -hmm. to be supportive of, um, particularly of a advocates and activists uh, in the places uh, where change is most needed. Um, you know, I don't know whether there's specific lessons that, uh, certainly I, uh, far be it from me to say specific lessons that people ought to learn from us. I think that one of the things that any society that has made progress on, on combating discrimination, whether that's again, uh, on racial lines or religious lines or discrimination against LGBT people, having that, gone through that experience, I think makes, w makes you appreciate more the challenges that that it entails for others, but also have a good story to tell and a, a story that can be studied and learned from about how to make it happen sooner, better, uh, and, and more inclusively. Thank you. So now on a more general level, um, how does the United States talk with foreign governments about LGBT issues? It varies. Um, uh, I guess the one thing that I would say is we talk candidly and frankly, um, you know, uh, uh, Americans are known for that, and uh, this is an issue which, you know, though uh, s I, I guess one might say sensitive in some places, is one that, you know, it, it's been clearly articulated as part of our foreign policy. I don't think um, anyone is surprised when we either raise concerns about a particular case of somebody um, suffering violence or abuse mm -hmm. or concerns about a law or concerns more generally about the importance of making inclusive, uh, inclusive public programs that, uh, on, on something like combating HIV or something like that. Uh, so we raise um, with a number of different actors in, in, in foreign governments at a number of different levels. Uh, our ambassadors uh, in many places, uh, of our, our Secretary of State obviously uh, does uh, in many places and you know on a day-to-day -day basis the, uh, the the diplomats that are working in embassies and consulates around the world and the assistance professionals are, are engaged on a, on a regular basis with, with foreign governments. I think one of the things that we probably try to um, do in every place is point to the fact that this, in, in pretty much any place, this isn't just a conversation that we are having with foreign governments, mm -hmm. but it's a conversation that their own citizens are having or trying to have with them as well. And so, again, one of the things that you know we would try to reinforce is the notion that this is this is part of responding to your own citizenry because um, you know part of a government's uh, responsibility is to not uh, only be steered by the the fears or the prejudices of a majority, but also to make sure that they're paying attention to protecting everyone and everyone equally. And there are uh, fearless advocates and activists uh, in many places around the world who are making the case for those protections. And, and those are the people who we hope governments are also listening to and engaging with. Thank you. I just want to make a quick reminder to those who are logging in. If you are, please use the question field at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. Um, so an another question, um, how does the US respond to the argument that human rights for LGBT people or even homosexuality is a Western concept and doesn't even exist in some countries. 
You know, I, there's there's no uh, scientific evidence to suggest that. In fact, all things to the all scientific evidence to the contrary that gay people, LGBT people, have existed throughout time in every place, in every culture, in every religion. Uh, and this is not a Western thing. This is a universal thing. If anything, the laws that make being gay criminal are a Western thing. Many of them are still on the books from colonial times. They were exported by colonial powers and put on the books in many places around the world. So if there's anything that's, that's Western, it's actually the criminalization of, yes. of LGBT people that's Western. Uh, you know, and human rights, the, the fact is the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, other human rights instruments are abundantly clear that human rights apply to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And there, there is absolutely no reason to see LGBT people as separate and apart from that. Uh, and you know, societies will be stronger. It's, it's, it's a work in progress. But societies, all societies, and you know, my own country is still a work in progress in 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 many uh, in many respects. And you know, we get stronger every time we do better at protecting the equal rights of everyone. Thank you. Um, so how do events in the U.S., um, like the Defense of Marriage Act case or the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, impact our conversations on LGBT issues overseas? Well, I think um, certainly, like any human rights issue, uh, 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 events at home mm -hmm. affect your credibility. Um, they affect the story that you have to tell. They, ha they affect the perspective that you bring um, when you engage overseas. And so. Uh, I can remember when I started this job uh, a, a few years ago, when I would engage on, say, discrimination in employment um, for for LGBT people, and people would say, "But you still have don't ask, don't tell." So mm -hmm. you know, don't you have this problem too? Yes. And you know, there's kind of two answers. One is one is that um, you know we're we're working on it, and, and, and the second is that you know, human rights advocacy, particularly within a foreign policy, isn't about saying I'm perfect and you should you should be perfect like me there's a universal standards are something for all of us to aspire to you don't have to be perfect to support them mm -hmm. um, supporting them does mean engaging in good faith and putting hard effort into making your own government more perfect and I think you know the Obama administration has prioritized on a number of uh, issues m the efforts to build a more perfect union uh, and this is one of them. And so the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I think, was a, was a significant achievement. And it has uh, made my job easier in the sense that it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that I can point to instead of as something we're still working on, mm -hmm. as something that we, ac that we accomplished and that, um, that was a tough step uh, in our political system uh, and that, that demonstrates that uh, we recognize that things can be difficult, but that they're possible and that effort should be put behind them. Thank you. We're going to turn back to our journalists now. We do have a question from Marina Mikovic from Key Connection Media, again from Serbia. Last year, Pride Parade in Serbia was canceled because it was voted unsafety. How can LGBT people feel safe? And what is obligation of every country in the world to provide to LBG, LGBT people to use their rights? You know, this is an issue that comes up in a, in a number of places, and you know, uh, it it is uh, providing protection for uh, people to gather peacefully, to peacefully assemble uh, and 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 march or, mm -hmm. or demonstrate, is one of the things that governments have to do, and it it's actually really hard work. It takes you know a lot of planning. Sometimes it takes you know doubling up on shifts for police mm -hmm. if you know that there's going to be counter protesters or if you know there's the possibility of of that. You, you, uh, it, it is a tough challenge, but it's something that governments everywhere are, um, uh, many governments are working on. It's something that governments can actually, this is a, a great example of a place where governments can help each other, uh, where sharing um, technical capacity on how you plan for protecting people as uh, uh, who gather peacefully, who peacefully assemble. Um, you know, that, that's something that actually we have an opportunity to make progress on going forward, but it's certainly a very real challenge. I think, you know, it is a success for the government when they are able to organize the police in a way that uh, protects the rights of their citizens to peacefully assembly and demonstrate. It is a success for the government because they have made it possible for and protected the, the human rights of, of their citizens. And so, um, you know, we should recognize in the places where that's difficult that it is difficult and that 
when governments succeed, um, you know, they're doing the right thing. And where pl in places where that, that that protection hasn't been given, we should encourage governments to take steps to make that protection possible because that's uh, part of uh, their protecting the human rights of their citizens. Thank you. So now going back to on a more general level, um, how are U.S. foreign aid decisions, including PEPFAR funding, impacted by a country's LGBT policies? You know, I think it's probably more accurate to say that uh, foreign aid effectiveness is impacted by LGBT, a country's LGBT policies. Uh, you know, uh, we have made it uh, clear that in designing our assistance programs, we, t we take into account um, in design to make sure that our, our, our programs will be as high impact as possible. That, and we know that economic empowerment programs aren't as high impact if they leave out women or if they leave out religious minorities. Yeah. Similarly, if they leave out LGBT people, they can't be as high impact. Um, LGBT people, like other vulnerable groups, are often economically marginalized. They're often vulnerable to particular health risks, et cetera. And so when we design our programs, we try to take that into account. And one of the things that, that countries uh, that are working on removing discriminatory laws will find is that our assistance can be more high impact for them, can deliver more for them if they remove the discriminatory laws that contribute to, contribute to stigma because that kind of stigma undermines the effectiveness of our assistance. Thank you. Well, Dr. Baird, that's all the time we have today. Um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter using our Twitter handle at state, D-E-P-T, or at Human Rights GOV. And to our participants, thank you for joining us at Live at State from Brussels with Deputy Assistant Secretary Daniel Baer. And thank you for submitting so many great questions. Goodbye until next time.